In this video, we're going to take a look at the Minoan civilization. Now, I know I said at the end of the last video we were going to look at the Mycenaeans, but actually it's more appropriate to start with the Minoans because they are the first ancient civilization in Greece. In fact, they are the first ancient civilization in Europe. And so, again, it is more appropriate to start with them. Now, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans are the two great Bronze Age cultures in ancient Greece. Eventually, they would disappear, and that would lead to the Dark Ages. And everything pretty much hit rock bottom there. And then out of that, of course, came Archaic Greece, where the ancient Greeks began to pick up the pieces, and that eventually would lead into Classical Greece. So, let's take a look at the Minoans first. Now, in terms of Minoan civilization, there are four major time periods, and these are divided up in terms of looking at architecture. And the reason for that is because there is no written history. So the kings are unnamed, the queens are unnamed, the wars are unnamed, and so we don't have any wars to establish a new period. And so again, we have to use architecture, and that means archaeology. So we are completely reliant on archaeology to give us an idea of what the Minoans were all about. And let's step back and think about that for a minute. Imagine we live in an alternate history right now, and let's make some assumptions. Let's assume that Latin has never been deciphered. And let's also assume that there were no ancient historians in Rome to give us a written history. So Plutarch and Livy, they never existed. And let's make yet another assumption that Rome was abandoned after the fall of the city, and it was never reoccupied. And so you are an archaeologist in this new alternate history, and you travel around the Mediterranean, and you begin to notice all of these buildings that have a common architecture. And you make the assumption that these were built by the same civilization, and you also assume this must have been a great civilization. And eventually you work your way back to Rome, and you work your way back to Capitoline Hill and the Forum, and you locate the first buildings of this great civilization. And through radiocarbon dating, you are able to date the first Roman buildings all the way back to the 6th, 7th, and 8th century BC. And that would give you a good starting point for Roman civilization. And you would also make the assumption that this was, in fact, the capital. But then it gets tricky. How would you know about the start of the Roman Republic? That we have pretty much relied on written history. I think it would be very difficult to identify that. And so you may see a new building in the 4th or 3rd century BC and decide that that is a new epoch instead of the start of the Republic in 509 BC. And so we fast forward another several centuries to the movement away from the Republic to the Roman Empire. How would you know about that? Again, most of what we know about that is from written history. Now, you may find all of these sculptures of this one man. We know him better as Julius Caesar, but since you were unable to decipher Latin, you would have no idea what his name was. But you could ascertain that this was a very, very important man. So important that you might make the assumption that after finding all these sculptures of Julius Caesar, you may make the assumption that this was in fact a god. And actually, you would be partially correct. Julius Caesar was in fact deified. He became the divine Julius. But you would know nothing more about all the civil wars and all of his great victories and the fact that he is one of the great military generals in history. None of that would probably be known. Now let's say you are digging around Rome and you come across this wonderful spectacular building. We know it better as the Pantheon. And maybe that would become your new epoch in Roman history. You would say something's different here. This building, I have never seen anything like this, and you would establish a new epoch in Roman history. And eventually you would start to notice that the Roman architecture and all the items inside basically disappear altogether. And you would have a good chance to carbon date that to around the 5th century BC. So the point I'm trying to make is you'd have a good idea of when the Roman civilization started, you'd have a very good idea when it ended, but everything between gets more difficult. And so that's what archaeologists and historians are facing when they try to examine the Minoan civilization. Okay, so let's take a look at the four major time periods in Minoan civilization. The first is called the pre-palatial, and this was characterized by a decentralized culture, and so there was no centralized authority that would occur in the later periods, and so society is very communal and very localized. But then the Minoans really get going in the next time period, and that has been identified as the Old Palace period. And again, it is identified by architecture. And these involve some very large palaces that have been discovered. And these were the epicenter 
for their respective communities. And so this is really where Minoan civilization gets going. Also during this time period, there was a central figure, a king. And so there would have been a social hierarchy in place that was divided into nobles and common people and perhaps even slaves. Now this period is dated between 1900 and 1700 BC. Now some archaeologists will push this back to around 2000 BC, but the most common accepted idea is that it occurred between 1900 and 1700 BC. Now around 1700 BC, something terrible happened. And the most commonly held view was that there was a massive earthquake that wiped out the existing palaces. But it did not take the Minoans a long time to recover. They rebuilt new palaces, larger palaces, and much more spectacular. And Knossos, which we can see on the right, is one of those palaces that was built during this time period. And we will talk all about Knossos in a few slides. And so this period occurred roughly between 1700 and 1400 BC. And it was during this time period that the Minoans hit the apex of their civilization. And the Minoans were actually able to establish an extensive road network that connected some of the palaces and towns together. And there is evidence of extensive trade activity. And we know this through Minoan pottery. And that distinctive pottery has been discovered in the east in Egypt, and even as far as Mesopotamia. And of course, all of this is happening on Crete. But the Minoan culture also spread out to many other Aegean islands. And so the Minoans had a huge impact during this time period. But around 1600 BC, a new competitor emerged. And that was the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans dominated mainland Greece, and the Minoans, for the most part, dominated the islands. The final period is called the post-palatial, or final palace period. And this occurred roughly between 1400 and 1150 BC. And basically this involved the Mycenaeans taking over the existing Minoan palaces and towns. It is not clearly understood what happened to the Minoans, but it is clear that they are gone by this time period. Now, some of the main theories involve a volcanic eruption that in turn caused a massive tsunami that in turn wiped out the Minoan fleet. And of course the Minoans had a great fleet. And so they were unable to protect themselves now. And this led to an invasion by the Mycenaeans. But again, this is very unclear. Another scenario that's been presented is that the Minoans were so weak, the Mycenaeans simply occupied these palaces and towns. But one thing is clear that the Mycenaeans definitely took over the Minoan held territories. But the Mycenaean victory was short lived and just a few centuries later they also disappear and then we get to the Greek Dark Ages. Now, the most famous archaeologist associated with the Minoan civilization is Sir Arthur Evans, a British archaeologist. And he was the archaeologist that really got things going. He started his first work at Knossos. And as he was digging up these ruins, he was amazed to see how large this palace was. And in fact, it was the largest palace on Crete. And so again, he was amazed by the sheer size of this palace at Knossos. And so he believed that he had found the palace of the legendary King Minos from Greek mythology. And so he realized that this must have been built by a great civilization. And so he coined the term Minoans, and that is what we use today to, of course, describe the Minoan civilization. But that was not what the Minoans called themselves, and we do not know exactly what the Minoans called themselves, because again, we do not have a written history, and the Linear A scripts that were discovered on Crete have not been deciphered. And so again, it is not clear what the real name of the Minoans was. It's a name that Arthur Evans used from Greek mythology. And of course, many of the Greek myths about Crete came about many centuries after the Minoans had gone out of business. But of course, the classical Greeks believed that there was a King Minos, but no archaeological find has ever proven that. Now, about the legend of King Minos, he of course had his great palace on Crete and was the king of Crete. And as the legend goes, Poseidon provided him a white bull. And King Minos made the assumption, and the wrong assumption, that he could keep that bull. Now, if you're going to keep something that God owns, you better get permission. And that was his big mistake. And, of course, Poseidon is angry, and the gods cast a spell on the wife of King Minos. And she falls madly in love with that white bull. They mate, and they produce this half-man, half-bull monster known as the Minotaur. And now King Minos has a real problem on his hands. And so he builds this labyrinth 
to hold the Minotaur. And you can see this 16th century depiction right here. And you can see there is this maze, which the labyrinth is most associated with. And of course, the Minotaur is right in the middle. And the idea here is he can't escape that maze. And if anybody goes in there, they have to take a ball of thread in order to get out of that maze. Or you will be in there permanently, and who knows, eventually you'll end up in the middle, and you may just have to face the Minotaur. Now, as the Greek myth goes, King Minos defeated the Athenians in a war. And as reparation, he demanded seven young Athenian boys and seven young Athenian girls. And they were to be delivered to his island where he would feed them to the Minotaur. Kind of sounds almost like an ancient version of the Hunger Games. Well, anyway, so that was a horrible reparation that the Athenians had to make. And so eventually the Greek hero Theseus decided to go ahead and volunteer in the place of one of these young boys. And so he arrives on the island, and as luck would have it, the daughter of King Minos falls in love with Theseus, and she gives him a ball of thread and warns him that he needs that in order to get out of the labyrinth. And so Theseus makes his way in there, and this epic struggle takes place between the Minotaur and Theseus, and of course Theseus can't lose this fight, he wins it, and so Athens is now free of this horrible burden that was placed upon them by King Minos. Now, there has been some discussion by archaeologists and ancient historians about how this minotaur came about in Greek mythology. And there has been some speculation that perhaps the later Greeks visited Crete and saw all of these bull motifs that are all around these palaces. And just perhaps that is how they came up with the minotaur. There's no evidence, though, that the Minoans were a violent people. In fact, all of the evidence suggests that they were very peaceful. They were very connected to nature by all of the numerous paintings and mosaics that we see of dolphins, bulls, birds, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. And so let's take a look at a map of Minoan Crete. And the first thing that should strike you is all of the Minoan sites that are around Crete. It is a massive archaeological enterprise that is ongoing, in fact. And one thing is you can see that Knossos is not the only palace. They are marked in red on this map. Uh, you can see there is Phaistos, uh, Trihada, Malia, all of these different palaces. But Knossos, as I said, was the largest. But first, let's move down south and take a look at Phaistos. And the major archaeological find down there has been called the Phaistos Disc. You can see that right here. The purpose and meaning of this disc are unknown. And so this is one of the greatest archaeological mysteries in the ancient world. Nobody knows what this was used for, and the seals or symbols on this disc have not been deciphered. But one interesting tidbit, this is the earliest form of topography that has ever been found. And so these letters or seals were pressed into soft clay using reusable characters. And so that I find just simply amazing. This predates the Gutenberg printing press by almost 3,000 years. The only difference was this obviously didn't spread around to the rest of the world. The Gutenberg Press did. Now, if you take a look closer at these symbols, even though we don't know what they mean, you can see right here there's a human head. This is a symbol of a shield. Uh, I'm not sure what this symbol is, but to the left of it is a horn. Okay, so let's move on. And so let's take a look now at the Palace of Knossos, the largest and most famous Minoan palace of all. And as I said, this is where Sir Arthur Evans did his first dig. And if you had first visited here, this picture on the left here, it would not have looked like this. This actually would have been a pile of rubble. What Arthur Evans did here was he started rebuilding the structure as he was doing his excavations. And so actually you can walk around the palace and get some idea of what it might have look like. Obviously, we won't be able to ever see it in its heyday. And actually, he was able to rebuild some of the rooms, which we will get to in the next slide. Now, on the right here are some storage jars that were found at Canassos. And these have been found all over the place. And so it's important to note that Canassos was not just a palace for the royal family to live and dwell in. It was a major administrative center. Now, you will hear the term palace-based economy. And they also use that also to describe the Mycenaeans. And what a palace-based economy is, is that it's essentially one gigantic redistribution center. Remember, currency has not been invented yet. That would be invented several centuries later. And so think of it like this. If you were a farmer and you produced a crop, you would bring it here to the palace. It would be stored here in one of the many storage rooms that have been found. And eventually it would be redistributed back to the people in the surrounding community. And perhaps you would have bartered for some other goods that you needed. But again, the main point is that this is a redistribution center, not a market where you go buy and purchase goods. 
Now one of the largest rooms found at Canassos has been since called the throne room. And so if you take a look at this picture on the left, you can see on that wall to the right there, there is a throne that a king might have used to sit in. And so that is one of the theories. Now, some archaeologists believe that this might have actually been a room for a high priestess. So again, without any written history, it's not known exactly what this room might have been used for. But the best guess is that this was, in fact, the room that the king would sit in. And if you take a look at that painting there on the left, you can see that that is a griffin. Now, one thing that has been discovered all across Crete are the Minoan double axes. And you can see that here on the picture on the right. And those came in all different sizes. Uh, some of these were actually taller than humans. Uh, these are some smaller miniature axes, but other ones were very large. And that also might have been used for many different reasons. It might have had a religious significance as well as uh, used for defensive purposes. Now, if you take a look at that picture on the bottom there, that is what has been called bull leaping and you can see somebody leaping over a bull and so this was a, a very famous activity that the Minoans participated in and of course today we have the Spanish who do those famous bull runs so playing around with bulls has persisted throughout uh, time apparently Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Now, this is another picture of the uh, throne room on the left, and you can see those pillars uh, there. Now, what you can't see is that this would have overlooked a massive courtyard that's in the middle of the palace at Canassos. And so that is where many of the major activities uh, would have taken place, including bull jumping. Now, several small statues were found that have been since called the snake goddess, but it is not known exactly what these were all about. Some archaeologists will claim that this represented a goddess that the Minoans worshipped. Others believe that this might have been a queen. And still yet, others believe that this may have just been a high priestess. And again, without written history, we don't know the significance of these miniature statues. And so now we come to the final slide and we put it all together. And here is a reconstruction of Canassos. And just take a look at that for a minute, how spectacular that must have looked in the day. The palace at Canassos was so large, it is thought that there were over 1,000 connected rooms. Can you imagine that? And you can see looking at that how connected and how open this structure was. Now, one thing you might notice looking at this structure is the absence of a surrounding wall, a defensive wall. And that has led to a lot of speculation in terms of what that meant. And one of the ideas floated around here is two things. First, is that the Minoans had complete control of the island, and so there were no threats from the land. And second, is that they possessed a very powerful fleet, and so there were no external threats from the sea. And so they were able to build these very, very open palace setups. And in turn, they are very connected to nature. And by the way, all of the rest of the major palaces found around Crete have the same type of layout. A massive courtyard in the middle, surrounded by several buildings. Now you might ask, how can archaeologists do such accurate reconstructions of these uh, Minoan palaces? And, and one of the reasons is, if you take a look right here, these are multi-storied buildings. And so they had several levels. Well, when an earthquake happened, these floors would just fall flat on top of each other. And so so they were able to see these different layers, and so that makes it very easy to reconstruct Canassos and other Minoan palaces. And so there was really nothing like this seen in the ancient world. The Minoans were a very, very advanced civilization. But it would all come to an end, and the Mycenaeans would take over. And we will talk about them in the next lecture.